Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I was asked to introduce Joy Thompson tonight, and I w which is a thrill and an honor, but I know that so many of you already know her that, um, that all I'm going to do is remind you of Joy Thompson. Um, you already know her legendary warmth and her limitless generosity, her towering success in real estate, her money where her mouth is, Ness, her fierce love for her community and for her family. In the few years that I've known Joy as a friend and collaborator, and yes, a red carpet date, um, I've met hundreds of her friends, literally hundreds, and every one of them grabs my hand and goes dewy and says, I remember that apartment on Jane Street. <laughs> so some of you know what I'm talking about. Joy moved from that apartment nearly two decades ago, be be well before I knew her, but everything that I've learned tells me that those magical evenings on Jane Street were not just playful affairs. They were fundraisers, they were consciousness raisers, they were community builders. Many of our original lesbian and gay rights groups found seed money there. Sage, Estrella, so did politicians like Tom Duane and Deborah Glick. And of course, once AIDS struck, with its atom bomb of complete political indifference and roiling religious hatred and grotesque suffering, Joy was among the first to call the caterers and the major donors to her home, especially for her beloved GMHC. Uh, but more on that in a minute. First, I want to tell you how I met Joy. That was exactly four years ago when I began working on How to Survive a Plague. I, I had never made a film before, and I had never done any serious fundraising, and it turns out fundraising is how you make documentaries. So I, I turned to someone who I knew who had done both of those things, Catherine Gund, um, who had been a member of ACT UP. Oh, you know, my phone's ringing. Maybe it's the Academy. No. Um, and she was one of the group's brilliant cinematographers. She had given me permission to work with her footage for the film, for which I was grateful. So I, I wrote her asking for a meeting uh, and to see if she would give me her advice. And by return email, she wrote, you should talk to Joy Thompson. And there was a CC to Joy's AOL address. And shamefully, I have to say, I had no idea who Joy Thompson was. It's hard to believe today, but even just a few years ago, Joy Thompson didn't Google. Like, literally nothing came up. There was no digital fingerprint for Joy Thompson. And I've learned that that's one of the central points to Joy's very unusual character. She's, she's just not showy. You know, she does her charity work for, for charity. And as an activist, she's one of those functional agents. She, she's a woman who builds organizations structurally, who empowers people to, do, to go on to, to, to break ground and, and find greater victories. And I know that now, but back then I figured that this, this woman with no past must be Catherine Gunn's social secretary. So I called her, and I called her, and I called her, and I called her. And uh, it took me months to get through to her, but um, she finally took my call from a s ski lodge in Vail, where she was weekending with Evan, who was at the time 14 years old. And uh, lucky for me, she was bored out of her mind and answered the phone, because Evan was on the slopes. So uh, she let me prattle on about this history of ours that, that risked getting lost, our collective stories of life-saving activism, and how through that crucible, we built a vast and powerful social movement as a monument to our dead. And then Joy told me about her own stories of AIDS activism, how when her friends started dying around her, she became one of the first women to volunteer at GMHC. And it wasn't just her. She signed up with her late mother, who, was, uh, who spent nights licking envelopes alongside, alongside other GMHC volunteers. Uh, uh, but very quickly, Joy joined the board of directors in 1986, one of the first lesbians to do so. Some, some of you may remember Nathan Kolodner, who was board president in those years. He had replaced Ira Berger when Ira died, and Ira had replaced Paul Popham when Paul died. Those were dark times. And when Nathan knew that his time had come and that this hideous and purposeless discriminating plague would take him next, he called Joy to his bedside. Like so many of our heroes in those years who were too young to die, he used his last energies to plan for a future he would never see. 
he told Joy, you're the right person now. You're going to be the next president of GMHC. Now, you just didn't say no to Nathan, but Joy tried to. She was new to board service generally, but Nathan prevailed, and she was elected president in 1987 and served through 1991, some of the worst years of the epidemic in New York. She grew GMHC's budget from three million a year to 14 million, but it was impossible to keep pace. I remember that GMHC was so overrun with calls from the sick and the dying then that they were forced to institute a first come first serve policy for new clients. There just weren't enough volunteers to take care of everybody. There, was not enough, there were not enough trainers to find more volunteers. There was not enough emotion to grasp what was happening to us. Before Joy turned over the reins, she had instituted the Lesbian AIDS Project, their LAP, about which I wrote for the Village Voice without knowing she had done that. And she left GMHC better prepared to handle the heartless onslaught and took a much deserved break to raise her family. When we think of those years, we think of how they finally brought the men and the women in our community together. Joy made that happen. Marjorie Hill often says that she stands on Joy's shoulders at GMHC. But everybody who survived those years, everybody working in AIDS today, men and women, gay and straight, black and white, we all are balanced on those shoulders, which is uh, one of the reasons that Joy keeps complaining she's getting shorter every year. But it's also why she gets now thousands and thousands of hits on Google. Things have changed. And of course, some of those hits are about her role as executive producer for How to Survive a Plague. <laughs> on returning to New York from her ski trip, she met me at a Starbucks and she cut to the chase. She said, you're going to ask me for money, aren't you? It seemed encouraging, but I still stammered. And she said, it's hard asking for money. I learned that at GMHC. Here's what you're going to do, she said. Go figure out how much you're going to ask me for, and then just ask me. Be direct. Uh, at our next, ex, next meeting, I was still stammering. So she realized that the only way this film was going to be made is if she took on the fundraising herself, which she did by calling many of you here in this room. And I, I want to thank you all for taking that call for her. So what a journey this film has taken us on in this past year. Let me just mention a few out-of-school stories from our time on the red carpet. We were all in alien territory at the Oscars. I was rendered totally mute when Daniel Radcliffe pushed past us to talk to Mario Lopez. He's about this tall. He actually had to reach up to touch my arm to move past us. Um, and there was this unbelievable time when Daniel Craig and Rachel Weisz came up to us and said that they were fans of ours. And I literally looked over my shoulder to see who they were talking to. I had no idea. But not Joy, she went to work. I watched her with amazement as she introduced herself to Francis Ford Coppola at the Spirit Awards and asked him to co-produce our next project. <laughs> Joy's a producer now, there's no question about that. I even saw her flirting with Marianne Cotillard. Anyway, the only time I saw Joy starstruck was when we, she stood, the two of us stood next to Shirley Bassey after her amazing Goldfinger number at the Oscars. But I'm going to let her tell you about that because she drank much less that night than I did. Okay, so the Judith Peabody Humanitarian Award goes to Joy A. Thompson. Hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Academy <laughs> and all of the Academy voters. Although I thought it was David, I thought it was going to be gold. Turned out it's pink. <laughs> oh, it's pink. 
Well, <clears throat> I guess I can finally take my tuxedo off. <laughs> Seriously, uh, thank you, David, for creating How to Survive a Plague. For creating the How to Survive a Plague family. All you guys. What an incredible journey you have taken us on.